introduction, everybody. Well, we're we're going to start our conversation. It's not going to be a lecture. It's going to be a conversation. And after a few uh, exchanges between us, I'm going to invite you all to join. And we've got a microphone in the middle of the room to enable that. There are more of you here than we have chairs <clears throat> for. So we're trying to solve that problem as we go on. But I urge all of you who are standing to see if there are any open chairs, just take them. And we have people navigating the hall, arranging to bring in some other chairs, which will start after we start talking. Um, so thank you all for being here. Uh, this is, as you know, the Delacourt Lecture Series. And this is the man who needs no introduction, which is why you're all here. So I'm literally not going to give him a real introduction. I'm just going to say to you that I don't understand how he does it. You could say one or two nice things. Right? I can say one or two <laughs> nice things? OK. <laughs> I'm I'll, kidding. OK, he's kidding. Say zero so nice things. So I'll say zero <laughs> nice things. I, I've got some questions that you may not want to answer. So I had no we'll doubt. save those till we get to the conversation. But I don't know the point about no introduction is I don't know how he does it. I can't keep track of all the books he's written. And he's done that while being a full-time editor at a weekly magazine that is uh, probably the country's most prestigious magazine. And somehow or other, he writes pieces for the magazine himself. And the last time he was here, he let us know that he passes on every single cartoon that appears in that magazine. And by the way, I don't understand more and more cartoons every week. So you have to. <laughs> but if you're, you're applauding? With me, good, good. <laughs> you're with me. You're with me. Good. Uh, OK, good. It's good to have some mystery in life. You want me to poll the audience? No, please don't. <laughs> How many of you under oh, for don't God's understand sake. the cartoons in the New Yorker? There you the go. One guy. One guy. Front. So oh. there it is. OK, so it's right. my. It's a it's, small club. It's my thing. The rest of you are lying. So <laughs> let, let me, so what I, as I said, what I'm going to do is just begin a conversation with David and then invite you to join in and apologize for those of you who are standing. And, um, and there we are. I'm Victor Navasky, for those of you who don't know me. So. Um, my first question is, David, I am told that, and it's public information, that the New Yorker has just moved downtown. <laughs> so This is true. This is true. So you have to tell us what that is like and what that means. It's, I think of the New Yorker as being a midtown magazine in walking distance from Times Square. Mm. It's been there for 90 <laughs> I did years. Too, until two weeks ago. Okay. <laughs> it's been there for 90 years. Yeah. And how can it be the New Yorker all the way downtown? And what kinds of problems has that move caused up to this point? And is, it gonna, is locale going to change content? Is it going to change the character of the magazine? Um, so that's my initial question. I would for you. bet. Can you tell us where you moved to? Sure. So we moved from the, the New Yorker for years and years was in a sort of micro-region of New York, 90 years to be exact, bordered by somewhere Bryant Park and Times Square. And the last, for the last 15 years, we're in Times Square. You know, 55 Elmos would greet you on the way to work as you came out of the subway. Times Square, we all know. And it's very simple why we moved downtown. The real estate prices got a lot more expensive in Times Square, and there's a, there was a better deal to be had uh, in a very beautiful building with views of <laughs> New York Harbor and the Hudson River, and I have no complaints about it, just the opposite. And the fact is that we will put out the same magazine, and I hope better and better, and website and podcasts and all the rest that goes with it. Maybe there'll be one or two more Talk of the Town stories about what's 16 feet out the door, then there, uh, as there, just as there were probably a slightly disproportional number of talk of the town stories over 90 years about Times Square. But even that, I'm being facetious. I, I, I really don't see any reason at all. 75% of this staff, a rough estimate, probably lives in Brooklyn at this point, everybody under the age of 40, and ain't me. But, so my commute got a little worse, and almost everybody else has got better. It's of absolutely no consequence. 
None. Your staff writers, do they have their own offices still, or are they going to share offices, which is one of the rumors? And they, how are they, they going to work if they share offices? Well, to be very honest, a, a, a majority of the writers who had offices in the previous building came in at best fitfully, truthfully. So I don't think this is going to affect anybody's life. The number of, off, of writers who actually come in and use their offices really in a full-time way, and I was one when I was a writer. I loved it. I, it felt like a CPA coming in every day with my briefcase, and it somehow disciplined me. Um, are surprisingly few. And did you have to clean out everything when you moved down there? What did you throw out? It was out? quite wonderful. In the same way, you know, people when they move from the suburbs to the city, suddenly they're throwing out old lawnmowers and bags of leaves that have been neglected and 5,000 issues of old National Geographics or whatever. There was a lot of that. And suddenly or the offices seem a little pristine. I'm sure that'll last about three weeks. Right. And is the library what it used to library's be? library's the same. So the library has these, um, I think what Victor's referring to most of all, the most eccentric part of it, is that there are these black volumes. Uh, each writer who has any purchase on the magazine over time has published a number of pieces, and they look like your own tombstone. They're a little daunting. It's like, it's like those pictures of people who go visit their graves before they're dead, and it says, you know, David Remnick, 1958, dash. It's a little daunting, but that's still there, too. Good. You know, I, to be honest, New Yorkeriana is of modest importance to me. I, I, I love the magazine with every fiber, um, but the kind of twee nostalgia that goes on with it, whether it has to do with offices or the people that used to sharpen your pencils and stuff like that in the old, old days long before me, I, I, I don't think about it much. Okay, good. You know, I'm of an age where I grew up reading these multi-part pieces in mm -hmm. The New Yorker by Rachel Carson and Hannah Arendt and uh, James Baldwin. Sure. And they became books. That ran all at once, James Baldwin. They became, that ran all at all once? All at okay. once. They became books after the uh -huh. fact rather than. And why don't we do that anymore? And I don't see them anymore. You don't. I'll tell you why. Yes. So here's, you know, there's a sociology to everything um, or an economic history of it. In, in the same way that there's an economic history of why certain kinds of newspapers have crashed and burned in the Internet age, there's also a sociology or economic history why The New Yorker, after a certain point, published huge three and four part series. You're naming the ones that were brilliant, Rachel Carson, we know, all know them, uh, uh, John Hersey's Hiroshima, also in one issue, and so on. But the, the reason was, from 1945, there was a post-war consumerist boom, and all the advertising in the world poured into this magazine that somehow was in perfect sync with this boom. So much so that William Shawn, the editor from 1952, I believe, until the mid-'80s, had to gin up as much editorial matter as humanly possible to go next to the advertisements, and which peaked in about 1967. And some of those series were brilliant. Some of those series, by the way, were books that Sean got from a publisher. They cut them into four, and they ran. Rachel Carson was not something that was generated by The New Yorker. It was basically a deal with a publishing house. And by the way, great that they did it. A lot of those series, I think you look at it historically, were not so great. They were kind of dull. And you'd have a three-part series on, I, I don't want to mock it, but it was a condition of its time. We do certain things that history will look back on and say well, isn't so great either. But of clouds or sand or, you know, dirt or whatever, whatever the, or, or something aggressively dull, but just went on way too long. And this receded with time for the obvious reason having to do with space. Okay. And, and so at the same time, Victor, we run pieces all the time that are by anybody's uh, description long and deep. Larry Wright's piece on Scientology is 25,000 words long. We have a profile that's coming in the next issue that's 18,000 words long. Um, I never get a letter, ever, saying, um, you know, really, there's not enough to read this week. 
I get the opposite. These, they pile up, they, I can't get to it all, all that stuff. So I'm, this is not, uh, I have a million concerns on my head. The, the, and I should add one other thing. Publishers have changed 180 degrees about how they feel about these series. In the old days, they, they thought running a four-part series that was essentially the book in The New Yorker and then having it come out as a book six months later was the bee's knees. It was great. Now publishers would sooner shoot themselves in the foot than do that because they think then the reader has quote unquote read the book and, and therefore won't buy the book. It, they changed 180 degrees. So these are factors not of sensibility or uh, the fact that we've uh, retracted from our interest in depth, but there are other factors at work too. Okay, but am I wrong in my reading and I I get the New Yorker every week. I don't read it from page one to the end, but Nobody I read what's interesting. Nobody does, except me. But am I wrong? My sense is that you don't do that much running of shorter self-contained excerpts from books that you prefer to publish I, your own original we, material. We, pref we vastly prefer to do our own material. Um, it's more fun to generate it. Uh, but, you know, a week ago we did an excerpt from a book by Elizabeth Alexander. Uh, who is um, head of the African American Studies Department at um, Yale. And it's a, a self-contained essay about the death of her husband, uh, who was from Eritrea and who ran a restaurant. And it's just a beautiful essay about grief. It'll come out in a few months as a book. In the same issue, there was an excerpt from Toni Morrison's new novel. But you're absolutely right. I think that um, it's a great deal more exciting to generate original work. Um, but I don't want to overlook, you know, right. Jonathan Franzen has just finished a novel. You can be damn sure we're going to excerpt that. Right, okay. You, as I mentioned earlier, the last time you were here, you told us that you play a role in selecting the cartoons. Do you play a role in selecting the poetry? No. No. Now, why is that? Because is that Paul Muldoon, important? Because Paul Muldoon uh, does it, and Paul Muldoon is way better at it than I could ever be. And once in a while, for various technical reasons, I'll say maybe we can't carry that poem. Or it, I, I have, I used to have more to say about the poetry than I, I do um, I, about the poetry. The, on cartoons, the way it works, Victor. I don't want you to think that I'm spending hundreds of hours on the cartoons. The way it works is that we have a cartoon editor, a crazy, wonderful, very funny cartoonist named Bob Mankoff, and. He is getting hundreds of rough drafts, what are called roughs, drawings a week. He comes into a, me a weekly meeting with me with about 60 or 70, and then I pick about maybe 15, 20, 25, depending on the week, with an eye toward getting a range of artists, a range of kinds of jokes, so it's not all Desert Island cartoons or frustrated husbands or frustrated wives or, you know, neurotic whatever. It, it, it needs to be a kind of... Um, Range. Okay. The, I mean, it used to be that Ross famously would meet with Ray, or I guess it was Ray Ir Irvin. Irvin, and the cartoonists were lined up outside the office waiting to no, see. No, I would. That no, that's. I, I think anymore. that's. I think that's inhuman. That? I think to 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 have artists or writers sitting outside your door. Okay. While you determine, like King Solomon, yay and nay, is an right. act of extraordinary cruelty. To okay. so who? <laughs> to the writer or the artist. Good. Okay, good. That was a long time ago. Good. 1930, I think. Right, okay. okay. Can you share with us your system for assigning pieces? How many are because someone comes in and, and who's a staff writer mm -hmm. and says, I want to do such and such. George Packer says, I've got to do such and such this week. Or is this the idea of you, your editors? Here's what I reject. I reject, maybe it's just for me, but I reject the notion that any one soul has the depth of knowledge and the range of knowledge and sensibility to, in his, in his or her own head, make the hundreds of decisions in a, in a given year, or thousands of decisions in a, in a given year, all by themselves. I think that's ridiculous and vain and mythological. I am constantly talking to people in the office and out of the office on what might be a good idea. It happens, it happens willy-nilly. If Steve Call comes to me and says, I have a, an idea for a piece, we talk it through, 
And if that leads to a peace, great. If, I, if the reverse happens, he may say, well, that's, that's okay, but it reminds me of this other thing I may do. Or, a, or in an editorial meeting, we have an editorial meeting on Tuesday afternoons, all we do is everybody comes to the meeting, whoever's invited that given week, and it rotates all the time. It can be a checker, it can be an editor, it can be a, 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 a copy editor. And they come to that meeting with three ideas. A big list develops. And if a writer is kind of lost or kind of searching, they look at that list and they say, oh, oh, that's, that's interesting. So it happens the way it happens. The myth of the New Yorker under Sean was that all the ideas only came from the writers. It was, it was myth then and it's myth now. Okay. So people in this room who want to suggest ideas to you aside from lining up after our conversation is over, what should they do? Uh, at, the, at the cost of um, keeping me up all night, David underscore Remnick at NewYorker.com. You wouldn't be the first. Uh, okay. And you, you certainly won't be the last. And, and, you know, things come of it. There's somebody here at the school who shall go unnamed who, through, through a teacher, came to me and is working on something now that may come to something great. I don't know. You get it where you get it. You get, get it where you get it. George Packer's easy. Right. George Packer's easy. Steve Call's easy. I, you know, these people have been at it for a long time. They know what they're doing. Three quarters of the time, my job is to say, that sounds great. I, I, I'm not kidding around. And, and there's other work to be done, but we're constantly looking for uh, younger writers um, and, quite frankly, you know, a, a more diverse cast of characters. Um, and that has to come where it comes. Um, could you say it again, David underscore? <laughs> David underscore Remnick at NewYorker.com. the NewYorker.com. It's the most valuable thing you're going to yeah. hear all year here. So that's great. Take it, write it Did down. Did you just tweet that? To memory. That, that's, an, <laughs> that's an act of severe something that I can't quite put my finger on. Okay, it's all right. All right. You're having a conversation about what's for dinner. Okay. That's all right. Could you say a word and enlighten us about the New Yorker's finances. We're making yeah. money. And, and I, think, money. I think we, I'll, I'm completely open about it. I have no, why we'll make a secret of it? Uh, you know, it's never going to dis, out distance the, uh, the balance sheet of Facebook. Um, or, you know, but we are profitable. And the New Yorker, with the exception of a, of a bad patch um, that, you know, lasted about a decade in the 90s, for a variety of reasons, and no one's fault, but a variety of reasons, we've been we've been doing quite well again since about I guess 2001. I'm, I have no illusions. We are in the midst of a technological revolution, and we were buffeted also. We, there, around 2008, you had not only a technological revolution that was taking off and accelerating, well into its maturity, I should add, but also a gigantic financial crisis, which of course is you know not going to help anything in the economy, much less advertising. So there are pressures, and we have to be alert to, smart about, about all these trends, and at the same time, keep our ethics, our values, our heart, and our soul as we shift how we deliver the magazine. Uh, we have a Snapchat e e experiment coming in, in a week. Um, a lot of people in this room probably read stories on their phone more and more. Uh, our, our print circulation has not gone down. In fact, it's gone up a teeny bit. It's, it's very significant. Uh, and obviously, a lot of people are reading on you know, an iPad or, or, a, or a desktop. So it, you have to be alive to that. And that revolution is it's, it's, it's long standing. And I think there's a long way to go. And um, you have to pay attention to it, be alive so, to it. So when you say you're making money, uh, how much? None of your business. <laughs> okay. Well, well, that's part of the question. Yeah. Uh, it's all our business, so we want you to be very successful. So, um, my memory is, and I had the number. I don't have it in front of me. When Cy Newhouse bought the New Yorker, it was for over a hundred million, a hundred and some odd million dollars. I don't know the paperwork on that. Okay. I honestly don't know. So I'm. Curious, I read the same things you did. Right. Okay. I'm curious whether there's a number that it's worth now or not. I don't but know. More, we don't know. I honestly okay, don't know. Good. But more than that... Nobody's uh, selling it. 
Okay, but more than that, one of the sort of cliche critiques of what's happening in journalism today is that more and more independent voices are being taken over by larger and larger companies. So I'm interested True in that. your report on your experience as working as part of this Condé Nast empire. Whether you, I mean, I assume if the New Yorker were in its own little office, it might not have moved downtown. It might have because of the rising rents. Mm -hmm. But how much of what the New Yorker does is influenced by being part of this larger ent enterprise? Mm -hmm. Good question. I, I Do I go to financial meetings with Condé Nast executives? Yes. Um, do they prefer that we make money rather than the opposite? Of course. Has anybody ever, ever once said anything to me about what's been published in the magazine in any kind of, anything other than an attaboy sort of way? Never. Not once. And what more can I ask for? What more can I ask for? I mean, the number of commercial magazines, newspapers, websites in which the ownership gives this thing over to the editor and his or her staff with that sense of freedom and latitude is, is rare. It's rare in the United States and it's even rarer everywhere else. So I, that is a gift. I'm not, look, I'm not naive about the business aspects of this and the business health of the, of the magazine first and foremost for me is to be insured so that this uh, existence continues at, at, at the way I want it to. Um, that, that's the way I'd answer that. And do, do you, are you given an annual uh, budget that you operate within? And uh, if you want to hire 20 editors just sitting willing, in this room tonight? Well, then I'd be an, I'd be an idiot. I mean, I, I can't just, you know, yes, of course I deal with a budget. All right. Okay. Of course. And who, who does that? Well, we have the, the way it works is that there's a business side of the magazine that sells advertising. There's a consumer marketing division of Condé Nast in general that deals with subscriptions. But I am, you know, extremely knowledgeable, and I have a deputy editor, Pam McCarthy, who's even more in, in up to her elbows on the business. Look, it's a it's a it's a big operation. It's right. not a, um, you know, it's not. With all due respect, and I, I like that magazine a lot, but it's not N plus one. It's not 15 people in, in a, I don't know where they operate out of, but, in, you know, and living off of donations to the magazine, which is a ter terrific thing, and a lot of good work has come out of it, and magazines like it. Nor is it an opinion magazine, which has a very different kind of business model. It's not like what we just watched play out with the New Republic, for example. It is a commercial magazine. Right. But it's, it's also, a, a, I have to say, a kind of miracle that it is a commercial magazine that publishes these long pieces, many of them political, not all of them easy, fiction, um, and critical essays and all the rest of the formula, and no photographs on the cover. I mean, who would have dreamt up in 2015 a new magazine or website, the cover of which is like a thrillingly dumb joke about Kim Jong-il uh, and, and, and the Oscars. And yet, it works, in my humble opinion. I mean, you were quoted... I-M-H-O, if you want to okay. put that in. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were quoted somewhere else as, as saying that when, when you were at the Washington Post, um, they had this sort of understanding with the owner that there would be no surprises and that when you came to yeah. the New Yorker, you had something that you didn't want to surprise Cy Newhouse. So you, so I'll, you I'll tell you the story. So um, what Victor's referring to is when I was, a, I was a baby at the Washington Post. I spent my 20s there and the last few years I was in Moscow. So my knowledge of what, how things worked at the top of the Washington Post was to say not, it was limited or mythological, but from reading the books, I know perfectly well that Ben Bradley, the editor of the newspaper, was not gonna just rush into print with the Pentagon Papers or Watergate breaks without at least alerting the woman who owned the place, Catherine Graham, and it was called the No Surprises Rule. So after a very short time, 
I was editor, and I had been the editor of nothing in my life before editor of the New Yorker. I had not been a copy editor, a deputy editor, uh, an assistant man, nothing, nothing. I, I was an editor in name only at a college newspaper called Nassau Weekly, where, where I did no editing at all, and I edited my high school newspaper, which is called, the, to my enormous embarrassment, um, The Smoke Signal, because we were the Pascack Valley Indians. It was a long time ago, <laughs> and it's deeply wrong. So suddenly, for all kinds of strange, deeply wrong, and I hope to God they've changed it. Um, so after a few weeks, I had I, a couple of months maybe, I had a story from Cy Hirsch that was, um, I, it, it accused a lot of people of a lot of things at a very high level of government, particularly foreign governments. This one was taking bribes from that one, and, and the sourcing was, was good, and the checking was good, and I thought to myself, oh, Jesus, I, I should probably call Cy Newhouse and tell him because I read in a book once that there was such a rule at the Washington Post. I mean, that's how much experience I had. And I called him, and I explained it, and I said, we have this, and we have this, and we have this. And there was a long pause at the end of the phone, and he said, well, that sounds very interesting. I look forward to reading it. And that was the last time I ever did that. The message to me was very clear. It's in your hands. You have a lawyer. You have fact-checking. You have your editorial apparatus to get this thing right. I mean, I know what the consequences of getting things wrong are, but there it was. It's, that's your job. Right. And does Cy Newhouse uh, spend much time with you, or is that...? He has, yes, absolutely. And uh, we've had Anna Wintour here as an editor talking mm -hmm. earlier, that, and the rumor is she is getting more and more It's not a rumor, it's true. Authority at, that's, within that's, Condé Nast, do you it, deal with her? I certainly do deal way? with her in a happy, okay. happy way. She's an unbelievably hardworking, serious um, person. Do we do the same thing? No, we don't. But I've gotten nothing but respect from her, and I have enormous respect um, for her. And she does not have her hands into the New Yorker. And, but, you know, we talk about ideas for Condé Nast, business ideas. We have points of, you know, collaboration. But they don't have anything to do with the coverage of Libya or, you know, once in a while I'll ask her her advice about, you know, some pop culture thing or, 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 or and we'll talk politics. But it, she's extremely respectful of the New Yorker and its independence. But, but she has much more authority because she's now the editorial director of Kanye Nast in addition to being the editor of um, uh, Evoke. Good. Uh, you know, last week we had as our guest the editor of L, Robbie Meyer, mm -hmm. and one of the questions I asked her was, I had trouble finding the contents page because it begins on page 32. Mm -hmm. And, and I know the argument that you have to have ads in between that. I would but like to have New more. I, I would like you to. That. I would like you to have more trouble finding the contents page. <laughs> um, look, that's a monthly magazine. They're, all their ads are jammed right. to, to 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 one issue. Um, the The New Yorker, by the way, used to not have any contents page at all. Right. And once William Sean was asked, "Well, why don't you, you know? This must be very hard for the readers. They can't find where the articles are." And he said, that's none of their concern. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there was, there was a certain degree of perversity to um, putting the names of the writers, for example, at the end of the, of the article. I don't mean just a Talk of the Town piece where they remained. There were no names for Talk of the Town pieces. Those of you too young to remember this. But there could be a 10,000 word piece. And then it, on, in little battered type at the end, it would say, dash John McPhee. Um, I never heard many complaints from writers when the uh, bylines went to the top of the page. Okay. Nor from readers. Okay. You, how much of your time do you spend worrying about print and how much about the online and other apps and the, all the new digital contraptions and opportunities provided by I've never done a pie chart of my collective anxieties. <laughs> but. but it's a very big pie. And how it's divided up depends on the week. Um, I, I, I just do this all the time. That's what I do. I mean, you know, Victor, you mentioned 
I've done so many books. Da, da, da. I've written one real book while I've been the editor of The New Yorker for 16 years. One book. And it was something that was done in a kind of tumbling rush. This is a book about Obama and race. And I write pieces, but I really, of, of any substance, the, anything, well, I probably do it twice a year. Twice a year. And they're only, and they're cir very circumscribed pieces. They are not pieces that can spill over into weeks and weeks. My job, 98% of it, if I can pick a percentage, is to edit The New Yorker. And with a lot of extremely intelligent collaborators who know different things than I do. But is it, I mean... And I, it's basic, look, I, I, don't go, I don't go sailing, I don't go skeet shooting, I, I have a, quite frankly, I have a complicated life at home. I have an autistic, a kid with autism, who's a teenager, and then two kids in their 20s. That's what I do. I do The New Yorker, and I, my family, and everything else is, uh, so mo is extremely marginal. But and I watch too many movies. Right. <laughs> But is the New Yorker you edit, it's obviously not the same New Yorker that William Sean or Ross or Tina Brown or uh, Bob Gottlieb edited in the sense that the march of technology has accompanied Absolutely. what the magazine is. It's so the same the and different. It's of the your, of your I, I, I agree. It, it, it's the same and different in the sense that the ethos of it is the same. I, I think there are some differences, by the way, but, and we could discuss those, but it, it, its, its soul has to be the same, and how that reaches you, if you want to get it on your phone, or written in the sky and by an airplane, or how, how, whatever, whatever the, the reader demand on how we're going to get to you is, we're going we're to be alive to that. We have to be. We'd be fools otherwise. And if the next question is, in X years, how many people are going to be reading it in print and how many people on a phone and how many people on, a, on, on your Mac Air, the answer is, I don't know. I don't know. But I want to be there with you. And I want the prose to be exquisite and deep. And I want the fact checking to be as, as accurate as humanly possible. I want us to correct our mistakes. I want us to have the same values and we'll reach you the way we reach you. For a lot of people, this is the way to read it. This is not a bad technology. The Sunday Times is a klutzy technology because it just is. It's spilling all over the place, but there's, there are reasons, sociological and economic reasons, why it, it persists. How, how this will persist in percentage to reading it on that or reading it on this or reading it on this, I don't know. And there'll probably be some other device. That's that's almost a lock. Right. And by the way, you know, we are, we have a television uh, agreement with Amazon that's just had a, a, a pilot. It's, so it's in its infancy. So we're trying, we're experimenting with that, and we're experimenting, and are quite far along with podcasts, and then we're, and we're in partnership with with NPR with, N with WNYC uh, to start something there. Um, but again. It can't just have the New Yorker name and then be something wholly other. So if I understand you correctly, David, it's that it used to be we lived in a print culture. Now we live in a pixel culture. We this live in an everything talking. culture. And print everything is not. Culture. Print is far okay. from dead. But, but there's just an end to it. You know, I remember there's, <laughs> there's a great scene, and I think Don't Look Back, Dylan is gone electric and he's playing in, in England. And he gets up to the microphone and he looks at the crowd with this kind of nasty glare and he says, it used to go like this, now it, it used to go like this, now it goes like this. And he plays, I forget what the song was. That's the way it is. Right. You know, I, it, you're asking a lot about the past. I am interested in the past, respectful of the past, but I'm not running a museum. It can't be a museum. It can't be a museum of, its, of itself, otherwise it's uninteresting and it dies. We write about new subjects that didn't exist. We reach people in ways that didn't exist, and that's just natural. Okay. Uh, with all due respect, I didn't get to finish what I was saying. It was Go not ahead. about the past, it's about Go the ahead. present, because my question really is, in a pixel culture, can a magazine like The New Yorker sustain itself? And uh, is it at the center, is it at the core, is print at the core of what everything the New Yorker does and all this other stuff is 
surrounds it in a, like no, a solar it's, it's, system? It, no, it's not it's secondary. It's not it, secondary. It's, okay, it's in addition to. In. It's in addition to, and it's, right. it's, it's part of the whole. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, you know, in preparation for your visit, I, I went and I read, looked at any number of, uh, too many books that have been written about your predecessors and, and, and you. And some of them are quite unkind. Renata Adler says the New Yorker is no more. And uh, then why are we here? <laughs> That's right. All well, do. When, when, by the way, when um, people of Victor and my ilk say all due respect, it's kind of like when Tony <laughs> Soprano says all due respect. All due respect, she's wrong. Right. She's right, wrong. So I was going to ask, right. What, and these various All due respect. <laughs> <laughs> these various books, Yogoda and others. Read them all. Any I'm the only lunatic on earth who's read all of them. There are dozens of books about the New Yorker. Right. I've, I've read like That's what I want the, know. the what certified you, public accounts. What do you recommend, if any? Ben so Ben Yogoda's book, uh, called, I think it's called Around Town, is a very solid history of Ross and William Shawn's New Yorker, which takes you from 1925 to the mid-80s, and everything after that is a kind of footnote. Now, right. his thesis was, this was the charmed world of the New Yorker and everything else is a footnote, and I, and I think history has proved him on that point wrong, and I think even Ben Yagoda would say that now. In fact, I know he would. But it's a really solid history of it. Right, okay. And my second, m m my favorite book about the New Yorker, which I, I urge you to, you know, run, don't walk, to read is, is the letters of Harold Ross, the, f the founder and first editor. They are the funniest collection of, editor, of, 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 of letters that I know of. I mean, the great thing about those letters and Thurber's book is the creation of the at atmosphere that used to exist. And how you've been there now uh, many years. I have. 16 years, how many years have you been well, there? Well, 21 now? years, I guess, 21 I've been at the New Yorker. And, uh, and as editor, X six. How has the atmosphere changed there in the time that you've been there? There's a hell of a lot less drinking. <laughs> <laughs> On the property? I mean, I read about the early New Yorker, or, and just the press life, you know, newspaper life too, in the, you know, the 20s, the 30s, and the 40s. I don't know how they got to one o'clock, <laughs> a lot of them. I mean, it's just, it's just astonishing. And maybe some of it is, no pun intended, ginned up and not true, but it, it's chinned up. I get it. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but you know, if I have like a beer at lunch, that's it for the afternoon. It's just the way I was raised, Victor. Okay. Um, okay. Is is there any downsizing going on in your shop? No, no, not really. I mean, this look. There's. This is life. This is human life, and people get older, um, all present company included, and that is probably one of the more complicated things for anybody in charge of anything to deal with, how to manage that inevitable passage of time, and people do it at different rates. I'm happy to say that the great Roger Angel won a National Magazine Award a week and a half ago. He is 94, and he writes for the magazine. Does he write as much as he did in 1965? No, um, but he's a presence at the magazine. Um, that's, but if you're asking about mass layoffs, like you saw at the New York Times, uh, happily no. But I will say this, we have a, we have a, we have, I don't have a staff the size of the New York Times, too. And a lot of the pieces that you're seeing are people that are on partial contracts, or they're freelance, or they're one-offs. So it's, it's a much more fluid um, uh, structure than the enormity of a big uh, metropolitan newsroom like the Times. But speaking of the great Roger Angel, who is great, friend, is he going to have a place to go in the new He's, office? He was just there today. He was and there yes. today? Yes. Okay, good, good. Well, that's great. Let me ask just one more question and in invite the rest of you now to join in this conversation. Um, and it's very simple. What is your advice to the younger writers <laughs> sitting in this room who want to be you? Uh, they're not going to be you, but they want to get their start in the business. Do you have any? That's the hardest one, and I'll tell you why. Because when I, all the advice 
that I remember from when I was your age and your age and your age is completely or at least partially moot. It's nothing to do with anything. When people would ask, get, ask that question when I was 22, 23, whatever it was, it was a completely different media universe, right? They'd say, go work at the Patriot Ledger in wherever that is, New Hampshire, or the Rutland paper in Vermont, or Montana, or go to the Bergen Record, and then you work. It was a different media universe. A lot of these places don't exist. I don't need to tell you. You don't even know the names of these, the things that I'm naming, because they're, they're dead, or they've been, or, or some of them are dead. So it's a little complicated. On the other hand, there was no slate, there was no medium, there was no all, uh, Vox, and all these other things that are extremely interesting, and you can be damn sure that the likes of me and people who are in my cohort are reading them very carefully. Not that we're above them, and you'll necessarily want to go from that thing to that thing, but I'm reading that all the time. Do you find things in all and out of this that you wish were you in the bet. New Yorker? You bet. And for, let me give you an example. We have a a young woman named Emma Allen, who is, I don't know what she is, 24. She's, she's Susan Morrison's assistant. That's her job. Susan Morrison, who edits Talk of the Town and Humor, the shouts and murmurs. Emma Allen, in the last few months, has brought in more young humor writers. Now, ha this is an advantage of the website, because we, we can do this every day. It's not just one a week. So suddenly, people from Toast, Hairpin, um, where else? All, the All, um, any number of places. Um, names that I ev knew vaguely or not at all were surfaced by Emma Allen. And they made their way into New Yorker Online and in print. Cora Frazier is, is one of them, um, who has an extremely funny piece in the anniversary issue next week. She, I don't know what she is, 24? That's a fantastic thing. Great. So. It, it's not that the doors are closed, it's just that the doors are different. The problem is, and because I don't want to be, you know, Pollyannish about it, the problem is making a living at it. That's changed. And what I don't want to encourage in the structure of the New Yorker is some sort of cultural underclass. And that's tricky to figure out now that we, we've expanded, how do you structure yourself financially so that there's not the, you know, uber class and the unter class. And that's, that is a problem all around. Um, because I want to encourage young writers, but on the other hand, when somebody turns 55, I don't want to put them on an ice flow. So it's, it's complicated. But I, 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 you know, and when you're in the midst of a revolution, you can't see completely how it's going to turn out. Um, I'm, I'm not a, you know, where I'm a pessimist, where I worry deeply, is, for example, the function uh, that newspapers in mid-level cities used to play. They weren't great, some of those papers. They weren't perfect. Some of them were banal. Some of them got so constricted that they became shadows of themselves. But those were the civic organizations that sent the corrupt judge, the corrupt mayor, the corrupt city hall president to jail. And in the absence of that, I don't know who's going to send them to jail. Or who, because a big function of the press is to put pressure on power. It may be the primary. It may be the primary function of the press. And to see that gutted <coughs> concerns me greatly. Okay. Why don't you join in? Uh, and we have a microphone here. And the more students, the better. But and everybody's welcome. And I'm really, I, can I just say, I'm very touched and very sorry for those of you who are starting to feel their hamstrings tighten up in the back. Um, you know, eat a cookie, it'll help. Uh, I, but I, I really am grateful. Why don't you come to the microphone, and I take students to be everybody in this room. Fair enough. Come. Fair enough. And we have alumni the races here. to the quick. We have uh, hi, my name's Fergus Pitt. I work at the Tower Centre down the road. Hi. Um, so I've got a question about native advertising. Um, arguably, the New Yorker has been doing it since about 1941. In you know, the boundaries around native advertising are probably a little bit unclear, um, but it's become a hot topic in the last little while. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what the kind of conversations are that happen within the New Yorker about the threats to trust, or even and the opportunities to kind of revenue. If you could talk to that. 
Well, look, the, in a way you're right. If you retroactively label um, na native advertising, you, arguably there, it did exist for a long time. For example, Richard Avedon, who took editorial photographs in The New Yorker and other magazines, also did ad work. Uh, Ed Corin and other cartoonists who do cartoons and, as it were, editorial work um, have done drawings for various products. I think Weber Grills was one of them. What has to be safeguarded, and we have to find a, a consistent way to safeguard, is editorial independence. And I, you know, this, the New Yorker has got to find a way to do this with integrity. The New York Times is discussing this and hasn't come up with all its answers. This discussion has only just begun. So for me to kind of, in a public forum, uh, off the top of my head, give you every answer, I can't do that. But all I can say is that we're going to do what's right for the New Yorker. And everything that I've talked about in terms of values um, and editorial independence, that's what I'm committed to. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, we've spoken a lot about the legacies of past editors, and I was hoping you could maybe talk about some of the defining changes that you've made to The New Yorker while you've been here. I, you know, I, I, I'm, you've probably noticed by now I'm not shy, but it's a little, I think some of it's defined by the era one lives in, and I, you know, a couple of years after starting, 9-11 happened, and 9-11 is not just an event. It's a whole complex of things that grew out of it. So certainly, I, you know, my time has been defined a lot by uh, a, a, an in intensifying of foreign correspondence. Um, but I, I, I really would rather somebody else answer that. I'm not dodging, but, you know, it, it would be a, contents, a contest between uh, uh, gross self-admiration, which I would reject, and then kind of theatrical self-abnegation, which is probably almost as obnoxious. <laughs> uh, again, thanks for coming. My name is Nate McDermott. I'm a student here. Hi, Nate. I, I was wondering, uh, it's kind of a simple question, but sure. what makes for a great New Yorker story compared to, say, like, New York Times Magazine or The Atlantic or the New Republic story? Like, what makes a really good New Yorker story? Ta-Nehisi Coates' piece on reparations is a great New Yorker story. It's just a great story. And, you know, I, I'm not blind to other magazines when they're great. When I was, uh, when I was a kid, my father had a very small dental practice. You know, we were middle class, New Jersey, um, wasn't much of a practice, but what he had was magazines. <laughs> and on Saturdays and Sundays, I'd go down there, and as, you know, as I hit teenagerdom, it wasn't the New Yorker that was thrilling me. It was Esquire, which was in its kind of real flight path, and Rolling Stone, which was covering everything that I loved and hummed and sang and screamed in my room. So the New Yorker I came to later. So I, I, it, would be, it would be ridiculously provincial of me to say, uh, great pieces of a kind can only appear in The New Yorker. It, it, but that said, uh, it, can be a th it can be a thousand different things. I mean, James Baldwin's piece in 1960, somewhere in the mid-60s, seven, I think it is, is a h hugely unique blend of the <laughs> reported, the memoir, and the polemical absolutely unique to itself and rides on the force of its own voice. That's a great New Yorker piece. Um, Adam Gopnik's memoir about the, his old shrink is a great New Yorker piece. It's an essay of great charm. Roger Angel's piece that just won an award about old age and the, 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 the lust that persists to the very end, the sap that's still in the tree uh, till, the, till the last is a great New Yorker piece. It, it comes where it comes. I, I reject, there used to be people that would say that there was a thing called the New Yorker story, the New Yorker, particularly in fiction. And I knew what they were getting at. And this is something, a category particularly of 40s, 50s, and bef before the avant-garde starts to arrive, Bartholomew and the rest. But I, I, I just think it's, it's nonsense, really. I, you know, does Donald Antrim sound like Alice Monroe, does, who sounds like you know, Hilton Alls. I, it, it's just a fantasy. Great writers are individuals, and their voices pop through. 
And it's a reason why on the contents page, the names are so clearly there on the left, even before the subjects. That's really important to us. So I think a great story can appear anywhere. Uh, and I give all the credit in the world to, you know, when the Atlantic does it, when the Times Magazine does it, N plus one, something online. Emily Yaffe had a really interesting piece on Slate uh, about campus rape. It, it, it's, um, it happens where it happens. And it, is, and it isn't so common. Thanks. Uh, I'm interested in language. I spent some years at the UN, and the prose we produced there had to be understandable to people who had three years of English at the University of Temesvar. And what's happening to English now I find disturbing. Uh, if I go to a lecture, I see television, or what you call them, computer images. And in the New York Times and elsewhere, you get graphs, tables, charts, mm -hmm. and footnotes, all of which would be expressed more clearly in good English declarative sentences. At the Times, I feel like uh, Hannibal Anteportas, the enemy is at the gates. Now, will, will the, the... The enemy is always at the gates. And it, 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 in, with, in all due respect, <laughs> this is what happens to us with age. It happens to me, right? So the, the capacity online to insert a piece of film is a challenge to the writer. So I remember very distinctly having a meeting in the early part of the web, Roger Angel saying, look, I want to be able to describe in English how the hand fits over the baseball to throw a screwball, which is an extremely uncommon pitch and your arm goes like that and very few people throw this pitch anymore. And you see now all the time on the web, um, in, in, in it's, it's now past its experimental stage, where pieces of writing are interrupted by or supplemented by bits of film. And, you know, if you don't like it, let it go. But, you know, th this is what's happening. Writing is what writers do. We can't, it, it, you know, um, epic poetry died because people stopped writing it. It, it, it. There's no use bemoaning it. That's what it is. Um, writing used to be done mainly by rich people. That died, thank God. And, and a lot of things have changed, and some of it's discomforting, some of it's unnerving, some of it um, shatters our comfort zone. Um, but writing is what writers do. And, and, and so I, I, I think you have to be alive to that. Um, for example, when Donald Barthelme came out in, in his way of writing a short story, it didn't in any way resemble Irwin Shaw or the cl so-called classical short story. It disturbed a lot of people. Why was he using these funny words? Why, why did John Dos Passos suddenly insert newspaper clips in the middle of his prose? That was unnerving to people. So that's, that's experimentalism. Why is T.S. Eliot sort of breaking into um, uh, a different language? That was unnerving to people. Um, I think you have to, you don't have to love it all. You don't have to even read it all. But that's what writers do. That's what artists do. They disturb us. They undermine us. They shock us. Um, they even may repel us at times. I think that's true of the graphic arts as well as the written arts. So that, that's how I'd answer that. Will your editor still distinguish between persuade and convince may and my to do to and because of, or are these trivial, antiquated? Uh, Look, I, you're talking to an editor of a magazine who still has diuresis over, over, over his, the second O. Good, good um, for you. <laughs> I, I don't think it's a magazine that doesn't pay attention to exactitude, but it has to be in the phrase of, I think it's Liebling, a, a wild exactitude, otherwise, it's boring. Yeah. So I have sort of a question in the, in the kind of the opposite vein. Sure. Like, you know, I'm, I'm a reader. I, I've been a long time reader of The New Yorker. I read it now exclusively or almost exclusively on the, my phone. So and I think start I, again. I'm sorry. You, you, leave, you read us exclusively on your almost phone? Almost exclusively on my phone. Fair enough. And you have a long commute. And my sister, who's not, <laughs> who's not a uh, subscriber, listens to all the podcasts. So I, I totally understand Great. that. My question is, I'm a huge 
stalkerish fan of Emily Nussbaum, who's a writer for television stuff. I love her. Emily Nussbaum is our TV critic, and I, okay, I yeah, love her. Yeah, she's a lot. great. And I love her on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And she does a lot of stuff on Twitter that mm -hmm. she, I mean, she gets into it with people. She's very, very active mm -hmm. there. And she does a lot of stuff that's not at all related to what she does for you guys. And I wonder if you guys have any kind of policy about. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, who's got time to have policies about Twitter, for God's sake? <laughs> I, 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 I just, <laughs> I, I just, she's, she's a big girl. She can handle herself on Twitter. And she get, she, I, one night she broke Twitter. And I, I have to say, I, I, I love Emily Nussbaum. And one night she was live tweeting, I don't know, the Emmys or the Grammys or the something, SAG Awards, some Fakakta thing, I have no idea. And they shut her down. Because apparently, and she tweets so fast and with such fluidity that apparently if you tweet a certain number of times per minute, Twitter thinks you're a bot, <laughs> not a human being. And she, they just shut her ass down. And so the next, I heard about this, and, and I said to Emily, please, please write a piece for the web called The Night I Broke Twitter, because, you know, traffic. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, which is a third order concern, I should, should add. Uh, and I think she was a little embarrassed and didn't. Um, but she's, she's amazing. She's ama she has a piece coming out this week on Joan Rivers and feminism and sexism that's just sublime. So you read that next week. Hi. Hi. Uh, sorry. I've been reading The New Yorker uh, for about 55 years, except for a couple of years in the early 70s when it seemed too materialistic to me. But I got too over materialistic? that. Too materialistic? Yeah, but I got over that. So. Uh, me too. So. <laughs> uh, I, I want to bring up something that perhaps is out of date, I sometimes fear is out of date, copy editing. Um, it seems, that, well I should say there are, there are a lot of things you've done that are different. Throw the pie, it's okay. It's really oh, well, okay. Well I already have, I, I write right. to you about this every few years. Okay. And, uh, Please dear God I answer. Um, but I, it's very upsetting to me. I read nearly all periodicals online nowadays except for the New Yorker. Mm -hmm because uh, the standards of copy editing are so low and I expect better of the New Yorker than mm -hmm. I expect of the New York Times or even the Wall Street Journal. And uh, even the print magazine, I see very unhappy mistakes. And uh, I just, I, I wish people paid more attention to that. Well, let me, let me say this. I. As they taught me to say in executive school, I hear you. <laughs> and it is a magazine edited by, written by human beings. We make mistakes. The old image of the New Yorker as a bastion of perfection was fantasy then, fantasy now. All we can do is try and, and really work at it. And not to be dismissive of your concerns, but I would say this, the levels of editing and the intelligence of those copy editors is, is at least what it was in the past. And I have in my possession, or in the, I guess it's now at the New York Public Library, a letter dated 1961. And it says, Dear Mr. Sean, um, clearly the copy editing standards of the New Yorker have fallen through the floor. I have found such and such a mistake in a piece by such and such a writer. Please do your best not to have the barbarians at the gate as they seem to have burst through. Sincerely yours, President John F. Kennedy. <laughs> so look, when you advertise as we do, whether ourselves or the world, uh, a certain level of factual accuracy and accuracy of language then the attention of the reader is a little less forgiving than it would be for the average you know, menu that you read or, or, or even you know, somebody's long ago blog. I, 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 I take your critical eye as a compliment, not the opposite. And we'll, we try to do our best every week. Okay? All right, but I... I, really I hear you. <laughs> I was just going to say, I must disagree with you. I, I believe the standards are lower now than they were. Well, uh, on the other hand, H. L. Mencken, the covers H. L. are H. L. Mencken better. used to answer every letter he got. 
with a postcard that said, Dear Sir slash Madam, you may be right. Sincerely yours, <laughs> sincerely you. yours, H.L. Mayor. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Rimnick. Thank you so much for Hi, being here. Hi, David. Uh, my name is Aaron, and Hi. you mentioned earlier that if you drink at lunch, you only drink one beer. I don't drink at lunch at oh, all. at all. Oh, okay. But well, it's nice of you to ask. <laughs> well, I wanted to know what beer is it, and where in New York do you go? <laughs> As they say at the university, that seems like a problematic question. <laughs> you got another question? I, I, I'm not drinking at lunch, I swear to God. If you did drink at lunch, <laughs> what beer would you drink? That's her other question. Whatever they got. <laughs> Brooklyn Lager, fair enough. Fair enough. But where? You know, I have to say, you know, we now have a cafeteria open two days ago, so that's where I eat lunch most of the time. I, I get home fairly late, so it's usually there while stumbling and then watching, you know, uh, the, I don't know, John Stewart. Is he still on TV? I think he is. <laughs> You know, I go out with friends, I have a beer, I, with dinner, I'm, I'm, this is not a big part of my life. But, you know, if, you, if what you're asking me is, can I send you a piece? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Hey. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I'm an international criminal lawyer, uh, not a journalist. Uh, thank you for being here. Pleasure. Um, I'm also a disabled person. And I'd just like to ask, what, if anything, is the New Yorker doing to address accessibility in terms of... In, in terms of our workplace or in terms of what we write about? Both. Well, I, I, from everything I know, and you know, as I mentioned, I, I've grown up with this situation. My, both of my parents were disabled, one with MS, one with early onset terrible Parkinson's. And I have a child who's severely disabled. So this is nothing that is, is, this is alive in my consciousness from forever. Um, I, I think, you know, in terms of accessibility to the building, if that's what you're asking, I, I don't think we have any problems there. Um, how much we write about this, I, you know, it's such a wide range of concerns that we write about medical things all the time. We have two doctors that write for us pretty consistently, Atul Gawande and Jerry Groupman, and we write about science. And, we, and I, I think one of our political prejudices in the magazine is a, an enormous opposition to what Michael Spector would call denialism in science, the sort of um, pushing away of scientific reality. But maybe I'm not answering your question sufficiently. So, um, so is there anybody that's raised concerns about making, for example, the writing on the internet more accessible to disabled person. Through what? <coughs> through voice? Through uh, just for sort the, of for the visually disabled. The website specifically. What's the? Forgive me, and I, I'm not. I don't want to be naive or disrespectful. But what is what is the particular problem that our site in particular is posing? No, no, I, I'm actually not sure that the website is uh, particularly problematic. I, I'm asking if. I, 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 I'd have to look into it. I, I'm not okay. quite sure what you mean, but, but um, I, if you have some more specifics, you have my email and maybe to sure. clarify. Okay? Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm Katie. I'm a student here, and okay. um, I was wondering what you think of the Brian Williams scandal. I thought we were going to get to the end of this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm enormously sad for him. I know him. I mean, I, you know, we're not best friends, but I, I know him, I like him, I think he's a, a talented guy. What he did was clearly wrong and unacceptable. And how NBC deals with this is, I, I don't know the whole of it. it, it I, to, to speculate and pretend that I know more about bef that what you know and I know from reading the paper would be folly. I feel, you know, what I just said. I, I, I just think it's, you know, an awful thing to, to witness. Okay, thanks. Hi, my name is Maria. Um, Hi, Maria. My question is not about The New Yorker, but about one of your books, Lenin's Tomb. Mm -hmm. I'm a huge fan of it. Thank um, you. I think it's gargantuan, it's encyclopedic, yet it's interesting, like throughout Thank you. and funny. Um, how long did it take you to write, and 
What was like the process? You got to meet so many people. Well, I was very lucky in, in, um, in that, in, in a certain sense, the Washington Post underwrote my research. They sent me to, to Moscow when I was 29, just at the moment where a revolution was intensifying under Mikhail Gorbachev. And I was there for four years. And I think pretty much from the start, I had a notion that I'd write a book and I identified certain set pieces within it. So certain pieces that I did at the Post or it, with the New York Review of Books became at least the germ of certain chapters. And I came home with a lot of research that either didn't go into the paper or had. And then I had a year when I came home at the Council on Foreign Relations. I got this fellowship called the Edward R. Murrow Fellowship, which still exists, by the way, a very good one, you should keep in mind. And so I had a blessed year of sitting in a tiny room doing nothing but writing that book. Um, that's how that happened. So you got to know personally Gorbachev. You Everybody. Know those people I, I, you know, it was a completely uh, charmed moment. I mean, a, a reporter today in Russia doesn't get to know Vladimir Putin, <laughs> right? No beers at lunch with Volodya. Um, but the Soviet Union suddenly broke open and the old way of reporting the Soviet Union it was like you had six sources and they couldn't give you their names it was horrible and you, everything was by hint and you know that's the generation of Hedrick Smith and Robert uh, Kaiser and the rest very very difficult to do ha Harrison Salisbury um, I arrived Bill Keller was there my wife Esther Fine Phil Taubman all these people and there's so few of us there's so few of us it was it was a it was amazing. You could not, you could, you could have written two stories a day without leaving your apartment just by turning on the TV and, and getting the newspapers in the mail. Wow. And I, by the way, I left my apartment. And was there a disc, did you encounter discord or like threats for some of the stuff threats? you wrote? Or, or no, I mean, look, we knew our apartment was bugged, but you know, how boring was that? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I just, you know, I, I don't mean to be flip about it. it was, this was not covering a war. There was violence here and there in spots, but usually we were late to get to it because it had happened and then you chase after it, and whether it was in Georgia or Azerbaijan or... It was, you know, a reporter's dream in every way. I mean, the living, you know, the, it's cold, but so what? Um, regarding like rewrites, did you do many of those or was you, it you just... You probably should let somebody else get a, uh, get a chance though. Oh, okay. Sorry, okay. Sorry. Right. okay, thank you. One more question before you go. Um, Half are a you, one. How does it feel not being able to work on books for so long and are you thinking of writing something else or... In, in the words no? of Lennon and McCartney, I feel fine. Okay. All right. <laughs> you know, during this period, I went over to the former Soviet Union with a group of writers and we went to the American Embassy and I asked them, the, the rumor is that Every phone is tapped. We were staying at some hotel. And uh, why would they want to tap? Half of our people were writers and, and 24, a group of 24. I said, why would they want to listen in on us? And, and the embassy guy gave me a ride back to the hotel. I was meeting someone. And he said, they don't tap everyone's phone. If they want to listen in to you, they put you on the eighth floor. I said, we're on the eighth floor. <laughs> and that was our problem there. So Good story, Victor. Uh, okay. Thank Hi. you. <coughs> Thanks. Uh, my, my name is Anton Mikofsky. I'm an alum. Hi. And I've been a journalist and a lawyer and who knows what else. Uh, one comment, one easy question and one serious question. Comment, uh, I don't think Brian Williams did anything nearly as bad as what Imus did. And you saw Imus kind of like bounced back. Uh, the, the question that's a soft... I, I, Imus, and I, I'm a far greater fan of Williams. I, Imus is not the voice of the news. That's the problem. He, he reached now, by the way, I have to say, I was talking to somebody much younger than me the other day, and I you know, asked him what they thought about Brian Williams. He said, I don't care. Because of the place of the, in other words, I grew up with you know, Cronkite and all the Jennings and all this stuff. If you're 24 years old, there's no way in the world you're watching the 630 News. That's just not the way. And so the authority of the anchor man, the, the myth of Edward R. Murrow, I'm covering the blitz from the top of the building. Just that's that that is. We live in a different world. Who do you I'm, watch? I'm not ex do, you, do you watch Rachel Maddow? Here and there, sure. Okay, here's the softball question. There's a cartoon in the latest issue 
of two elephants are drinking at a bar, mm. and the bartender and some, somebody else are at the other end and they're saying something mm. like, you know, they say they never forget, but somehow when it comes time to pay the tab, dot, dot, dot. Great joke. Okay. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Great joke. I love it. What's the softball part? I want to know, is that meant to be political? You know, it's like asking James Joyce about some chapter. It's best for you to interpret. Right. Okay. Okay. Very good. Now, here's the serious question. You spent a lot of time just in Russia. Just remember these people behind you were standing. Okay. okay just, yeah. This is a good one. You'll like it. Okay. Um, what is your take on the present situation with Putin and Russia and Ukraine based on your knowledge of Russia? I, I, let, that's a big, big subject. Um, I, I, let me just... On Putin, let's, let's limit it to Putin. I think he is a disaster, for, first of all, for the Russian people. And you're going to say, well, he has an 80-odd percent um, approval rating. Um, dictators always have very, very high approval ratings. And the, the mental press universe of Russia is way more circumscribed than you can possibly imagine unless you go there. It's, it's, it's a disaster. It's a disaster, but you, the whole Ukraine, let's, uh, for another night, let's, let's give the next guy a Okay. And maybe I should say this in the, in the, for the, at, at the cost of being rude. Let, maybe we should just do a, one question and so. I was going to give them, the people on the Not line. one question in general, you can do this as Good. long as you like, okay. but, but just Good. limit each person to, Good. yeah. Hi, uh, thanks a lot for coming here. My name is Jack. I'm uh, hey, Jack. a student studying magazine writing here. And I'm wondering, as you see, uh, the internet fill up with all these uh, long-form narrative uh, I think it's great. You know, outlets. Yeah, wh what do you think about that uh, It's staying power? And also, um, how does that kind of affect uh, your business? Sorry. Well, look, it, it doesn't. But it, it, I, to me, it signals that the ecology of what we're doing is healthy, that people want that. One of the, remember, there were a couple of ev almost evangelical cliches of the early internet period, and I would go to one dinner after another, or e internet evening where I would be invited as, you know, chief stegosaurus, <laughs> right? Because I was representing this, as we say, mature media entity, <laughs> vertically integrated. And, um, and they would say two things. Uh, no one will read anything long on the internet. That turned out to be completely wrong. But it was said with such confidence and the sureness of, you'll forgive me, youth, which I at one point shared with you. <laughs> and the other thing was um, information wants to be free and therefore no one will pay for anything on the internet. And we've now s switched to a paywall which was much more logical than the form of kind of paywall that we had before. And it's working. Just as it's working at the New York Times. The key is you have to have something that's uh, extraordinary to be immodest about it so that people say, well I can't get that everywhere for free. I want to have this. And I will pay what it costs to get one Frappuccino a week, and I'll have the New Yorker. And that takes in a lot of territory. Sorry, I forced in two questions there, but thank, That's you. All right. thank you. That's okay. Thank you. So listen, we're going to take as many of you online as we can. We're, we have a deadline of 7.30, but so make your question sharp, brief, I hear and stomach let's see grumbling. how we do. Good. It's going to be very brief. Um, okay. My name is Julia. I'm studying here. Um, why is there not such thing as the New Yorker in Europe? I don't know. I, I, I can't do everything. <laughs> I mean, um, there have been some imitators in other countries. There was something in Russia called Nove Ochividets, the new eyewitness. It lasted about a year. It was a complete homage slash ripoff. There was one in Hong Kong that, I don't read Chinese, but I don't know what the hell it was called, but it was a complete homage slash ripoff. It, it lasted for a little while and then died. It's a strange animal, this thing. It's a would strange you animal. Think it would work in Europe? I don't like know. This? You know, you would think, so in England, for example, that, but they don't have that. They have the Spectator, they have, they have, you know, and they have Sunday papers. They have a profusion of Sunday papers. Maybe that takes up that space. I don't know. You know, we have to recognize one thing about something like this. These things happen when they happen, and they're fragile. All institutions, and we have to cherish them. And it has to have the right people in it, the right values, and the right people owning them or supporting them. You know, if some clod got their hands on the nation, 
with ill, you know, with either ill intent, they could ruin it. It would, and it would be a tragedy. The same thing with anything that we value. That all, you know, things in life are sometimes more delicate, more fragile than we're willing to admit. And we, we take their presence and their alleged permanence for, for, for granted. You have to work awfully hard at something to not only be good in the beginning, but to sustain it and develop it and have it be good. So it, to me, it's sort of maybe more of a miracle that there's one here than there isn't one everywhere. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, my name is Hillary. I'm an intern at The Nation. Um, hi. Hi. <laughs> and um, you mentioned earlier Emma Allen and some of the younger mm -hmm. voices, the collection that she's brought to the magazine. Mm -hmm. What specifically has impressed you about some of those? Um, They're funny. Essays? Yeah. They're funny, and they have different things to say, and you can, if you don't watch it, you can get, look, Paul Rudnick is very funny, right? And Roz Chast is very funny, and I can name 10 and so could you. But if I only publish them, you, it's like listening to the same five bands all the time. Now they can have new songs, new jokes, but they're in a certain vocabulary and a certain range of concerns. And the same goes for reporting and essays and, and, and all the rest. So you have to do this. This is the, one of the most important things if you're going to have an institution or a, you know, that, that develops. You can't stick with the Algonquin Round Table. They'll <laughs> die. <laughs> Thank you. And they were overrated to begin with, I'm afraid. <laughs> Hi, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Jerry. Uh, is there guys, anything you guys feel like you haven't done particularly well yet that you kind of want to get your hands on? Or? You mean what we haven't done in the past particularly well? Um, I guess any. I mean, I, I've spoken to a few editors that say, oh, we're not perfect. I mean, is there anything you guys That's feel too like easy, I, I admit. You say I'm not too perfect, and then you fail to answer it. I, I think, we, I, I think we, we constantly have to become more and more diverse. I think that's, that's something very, very important. An American. <laughs> oh, gonna Thank you. Thing. For example. Hi, my name is Yvonne. I'm a student here. Hi. Uh, I think the Dylan was Maggie's farm, by the way. I was going what was through. It? You said the. It used to go farm. like this, now it goes like this? Yeah, I think. I don't know if it was Maggie's farm. Anyway. That's right. Um, it kind of tumbles out of him in that. <laughs> so you mentioned a few times the nation. CJR mm -hmm. just did a big thing on uh, Hughes and taking the nation, which had a great. Oh, you mean the New Republic? excuse me, the New Republic, yeah. and, how, and how it had this really great character, and it sort of started to shift in terms of like how to commercialize it. And I'm just wondering, I feel like the New Yorker has retained a lot of its character, and what, you know, it's like, oh, what is your thought about these magazines that might have pressure to change their character or some of their, what, what defines them? Look, I, I think for the first couple of years, Chris Hughes did everything right. Uh -huh. I think he did everything right, which is to say he spent money. He spent money. He, f for, for the most part, gave over editorial command to, to the editors. I, I have no doubt that in the past the New Republic had shortcomings. You know, I think they had a thing that they struggled with, with, with race, but I, I, I think this is more an issue of some years ago than it was two years ago. Um, as Ta-Nehisi Coates' piece makes quite clear on the Atlantic, I think on Atlantic Online, but I think there was enormous virtue in that piece, and I, something snapped. I don't know what. I don't know that it's irreversible, but something happened where Chris lost patience with his staff and with the financial situation there. Remember, the New Republic, the nation, uh, the conservative versions thereof, are, are not, strictly speaking, commercial magazines. They don't want to lose more than they have to lose, but there, there, there are limits to patience, and I think he lost his patience. Maybe he thought he was going to lose $2 million and he was losing five, and something snapped, and everything went kaflooey. I was not inside the room. I've read the piece that Ryan and Lizza wrote about for our website, which I thought was a superb account, and it shows you how fragile a thing of value can be. Do, I, I hope they turn it around. I, I, you know, I, I'm not inside that place, but it, I'll tell you, it'll take time. These things are really hard to do, to do well. Is there any advice you'd give if you were a journalist I, in that situation? Oh, sorry. Okay. I just, we're trying to keep okay. it to one question. Okay. I'm trying to move. But I would add, anyway, is that 
you know that the New Republic, they all quit. And when they sent the, the, their letters in at the New Yorker, when uh, Bob Gottlieb was appointed editor after Sean, scores of writers for the magazine sent him a letter and told him not to take the job. And that but they not, would all quit. And they didn't quit. There were quit. only one or two who Jonathan, Jonathan, Jonathan Schell and Bill McKibben. And Bill McKibben. McKibben. And and Bill other, McKibben. And That's a long left. time. Yeah, yeah. That, that was so it. This staff really walked out. Right. Okay. So. That's hard to, hard to absorb. People are not, you know, one person does not necessarily equal the next. Right. Yeah. Hi, uh, this hey. is Christiana Gregore, and I didn't really tweet it to you earlier. I was teasing you. <laughs> I know. It was, um, the first, it was the first phone I could spot. <laughs> but I did film you for most of the okay. uh, talk. Um, That's very reassuring. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a research scholar here at Columbia. And you I'm, are a research scholar? Yes, and I'm working on a book on coming to terms with my Roma, or gypsy identity, and how that led me to question being global and issues of identity hmm. in the 21st century. Now, I do know that the New Yorker covers some things on Roma issues in Europe. Um, the, last Adam, thing, the, yeah. the last thing was Adam Gopnik, and before I that, know, we, did we, a big, we did a big excerpt from Isabel Fonseca's book. We exchanged some emails about that, and also Andrew Solomon, who you sometimes collaborate with. Right. He wrote a story about his trip to Romania, um, where I am from. Correct. And my question to you is, like, I see, and I'm happy to see that there are some stories there. I mean, it's a group that is so underrepresented that the visibility is almost like, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, when you don't say any story about the people, the people almost don't exist on the social stage. Agreed. So Agreed. I'm happy that there are some stories there, but the stories are always presenting the Roma, or mainly presenting the Roma uh, in a way that is, you know, I mean, a marginalized group, you know, all mm -hmm. these stories, portrayed by others. Mm -hmm. And again, I think that's a great start, but... Um, I, I, you're <laughs> but it's how like having all your pieces about African Americans by but white But I feel people. like it's I missing the voice from, from inside and mm -hmm. the narrative and the way we experience this identity, and not only by the people... You're writing the book, right? <laughs> right. Um, my question to you is, um, what advice you would give to someone who would want to really have a completely new narrative about a group of people. I mean, presenting the it Roma people as a global from, person. It, it's not advice. It's for you to write your book and to make it the best book possible and maybe have a chunk of it run in the New Yorker or some other place. And that's where it comes from. Well, I'm looking forward to sending you that email. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. Good. Okay. I'm going to make this the last question. and. Be Grateful to all of you for making this. Such and I'm grateful to all of you. Discussion. Thank and thank you, Victor. Here, I hope it's a good one. <laughs> My name is Carol. I'm an alumna of this uh, journalism school. I'm a journalist and also an adjunct professor. And this question is for my students and for other new writers. Sure. Um, short of stalking you at lunch, which we've uh, determined we cannot do. Um, how do you suggest new writers pitch the New Yorker? Just, just uh, you you. send you a query, send yeah. you the essay, send you, uh, send you what? Well, look, I, I, here's, here's a tip. Don't just send me, I'm an aspiring writer, I really want to write for the New Yorker, and I went to this such and such a school. That, that's, sure, of that's water off a duck's back. I can't respond to that in a, in a helpful way to you other than with banalities like, I really encourage Go. you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not helpful to you and it's, honestly wasted time for me and I don't want to waste your time either. If you have an idea, I can't just say go do it because you don't have enough track record. I don't know who you are. You're a, you're a, you're a student. I, I teach, do the traditional query. Is that, is that, it's okay. it doesn't happen anymore? It's okay, or? but you should know that they happen a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, I gave you my email address and I wasn't kidding. But it, it, it's got to be pretty, you've got to say, I, I've got, it's got to entice me in some way. I have such and such a doc documents. I've been here. I know this story. I have unique access to the story. Here are some writing samples. And even then, it's very hard. We have a big staff. This is a pretty staff-written magazine. I won't kid around. I don't want to give phony hope, because that would just be dishonest of me. But we find writers the way we find them. And to be honest, usually they've published here and there before. The New Yorker is a very, very hard place to just start. It's probably a little easier for someone doing a humor piece because they're sending you the whole piece. It's very hard to go out and do a 7,000 word piece just on spec on the hopes that the guy at the end of David underscore Remnick at NewYorker.com is going to... Even reads it. E yeah. yeah. 
But I should tell you, I, people come up to me on the subway and give me yellow envelopes. Wow. <laughs> I'm not kidding around. Wow. At the gym. Wow. The second, the second question is, so what's your real address? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Thank you. Thank anyway. you for coming. In our modern world, that's my real Good address. Thank you very so, much for coming. David and underscore Remnick, we want to thank you for being here. This is great.